it's time for us to begin. Let's all take a song book and turn to number 364. Number 364. The Lord shepherd is, I shall be well supplied, sick is mine and I am his, what can I want beside, what can I want beside, it leads me to the place. This morning will be from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable of them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Please stand for the prayer. <laughs> Bow with me. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this another day of life that you've granted us and so thankful for this opportunity that you provided us to come into your house and to worship you. But we're especially thankful for your Son and our Savior who came to this earth and provided us that example to, to strive for and who willingly went to the cross and his blood was shared for us sinners that through that we have a hope of eternal life. We ask you to be with Alan and Steve in the work here at the, the church. May we all grow both in uh, spirit and in truth and also numerically. We ask you to be with all those who are our number who are traveling or will be traveling. May they have a safe passage to their destination and return back to us. We ask you to be with all those who are sick and those who are ministering to uh, them, and if it be your will, restore them back to us. Yes, to be with the leaders of the world, and may they look to you and, and your teachings, and that peace can come to this earth. Yes, to uh, go with us through all of our life, and in the end, bring us home to be with these. Yes, in Jesus' name, Amen. Three seventy-five. Three seventy-five. The Lord, my shepherd, I
faith I see Mount Calvary by faith I see that cruel tree I see his pain I see his strife by faith I see my random life 
And all I see his flesh so torn, and all I see the people scorn. God turns it away, I hear his plea in awe, I see his love for me. Through tears I see that perfect blood, through tears I see that blessed flood. He Christ is done, that battle's over, through tears he sees my sins no more. We are about to commune, let us remember Jesus' suffering death on Calvary, and let us do this in remembrance of him. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we're thankful that we're able to be here on this another first day of the week to gather together to partake of this memorial feast to remember your son, the great love that you had for us, that he had for us, and giving himself as a sacrifice, dying upon that cruel cross, and being resurrected again. We pray that as we're about to partake of this law which represents his body, that we would all examine ourselves and partake of it that would be a, in a way that would be pleasing unto the Christ name we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we continue our thanks for your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, who came down this earth and died that we might have the hope of heaven. We pray as we partake of this fruit of the vine that we can remember the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Clues with taking of the Lord's Supper. We also have another commandment to give back to the Lord, which He has so blessed us with. I'll ask Stephen to bless the offering. 
Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you've given us. Now let us give back to you that is rightfully yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now take our song books and turn to number 123. 123. such a glorious day that we have we can say with King David I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord 
I'd like to thank Ron for the song selections. They're, they're very appropriate for what we're going to talk about today. I would be remiss if I did not thank you for being here. There, your presence is indicative of your interest in things that are spiritual, and you are to be commended for that highly. Uh, our text this morning will be the 15th chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 7, that which Adam read for us. We're going to talk about parables. We're going to talk about one parable for a few moments, and what it means to us. So everybody, even those that don't claim any knowledge of the Bible, seem to know at least some of the parables. Everybody knows what the Good Samaritan's about. Whether they've ever picked up a Bible in their life, they know what that is. A whole lot of people know what the lost sheep, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, is about. And there's a good reason for that. Christ used about one-third of the time that he spent instructing people speaking parables. That's from people who look up such things. I don't, but others do. So he spent one-third of his time in this very important method of educating those around him. So let's take a look at that this morning for a few moments. Concerning the background, Christ is in his final period of his ministry, three-year ministry. This is nearing the end. He has turned his face toward Jerusalem. He will be crucified. He's aware of that. He'll be beaten. He's aware of that, and you can see it in virtually every word that he utters and all the motions that he makes. But that's where he is. He's headed toward Jerusalem. He is surrounded by both his friends and his enemies. And we'll see some of the enemies here in a minute. The author here is Luke, the beloved physician, a member of Paul's entourage, if you will, uh, a very well-educated individual, probably a Greek an educated physician, his, thank you, Ron, his uh, grammar in the writing of both the book of Luke and, and the book of Acts is superb. Uh, he is probably the finest historian in the New Testament. Uh, he is the only Gentile that we're aware of that wrote any part of the Bible. And he wrote approximately one half of the New Testament in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. This book was probably written sometime between 58 and 62 AD while he was with Paul in Rome for one of his two trials, probably the first trial. Uh, it was written, if you remember the first part of it, to an individual named Theophilus. Some people think that that's just a general term. I think it's probably an individual. It means lover of God. Obviously a well-educated individual and Paul seeks to impress upon him what is being done, what Christ has done, and then in Acts uh, the message by which people are being converted. But it's a well-written book. Uh, concerning the grammar and the other things that have. It's, it's written by an individual who is obviously educated, two individuals who are educated, uh, not necessarily to Jews, but to, to Gentiles primarily. Uh, it's written in almost classical Greek. Uh, it's detailed, it's accurate, and it's, uh, quite frankly, one of my favorite books to study because it follows the chronology um, perhaps more accurately than some of the other Gospels do. He, Luke, has more parables than any other author. Most of the parables are found in what we refer to as the synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They follow the same general pattern, the same synopsis. 
Uh, Luke has 24 of these parables, and that's more than than any of the other book. There's that, and for good reason. Parables, they come from the Greek parablum, if you care about such things, are word pictures. They're usually not very long, uh, and they're very simple. Uh, 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 you, Lady looks for a coin that she's lost. Uh, an individual is mugged on a popular highway and other people come by and see him there. Uh, they're simple and people can recognize what's going on in them, but they have a very deep meaning due to that. And that's what our the parable we're gonna talk about today is. It's very simple in that regard but the meaning that it carries is one that we can all take advantage of and make use of. There are multiple characters that are introduced here, and there are those that are being spoken to, and there are those who are inside the parable itself. Uh, Christ frequently does that. There are those who were what we would call commoners, and there are those who consider themselves to be far above the common people. And we'll introduce some of those as we go forward. First one that I mentioned are the tax gatherers, or the tax collectors, or the publicans, depending upon which version you have. And these people were just about universally hated by everybody. Uh, for one thing, they were collecting taxes. They were taking people's money. Uh, and that's never a popular thing to do. The IRS is not particularly popular with me. Maybe they are with you. Uh, but I'm not particularly fond of them. Well, these people were even less liked than our IRS. Uh, and the reason was that they got a percentage of what they collected. They worked on what the lawyers like me call a contingency fee. If they collected X amount, then they got to keep a certain percentage of that. That did not endear them to the people from whom they were collecting it. In addition to that, there were allegations, probably true, that some of the tax collectors collected more than they were entitled to. In addition to that, the Jews, they were collecting taxes for the Romans now. The Jews thought of them as traitors because they were working for this government that was over Palestine at this time, the Roman government. So they were not very well thought of. And these were some of the people that were coming to see Christ, were these publicans, these tax collectors. The second group that's mentioned are sinners. Now, that's not a specific group. Okay, that's about everybody except the Pharisees, as far as the Pharisees were concerned. Okay? They were people who were thought to be unlawful, immoral, irreligious, or maybe they were simply indifferent to what the rabbis, all the details the rabbis wanted to, to spread around. So they were look, certainly looked down upon by the Pharisees, and that's going to be the basis for what this parable is, is going to be said about. That. The Pharisees, and we'll talk about them in just a minute, uh, thought that the fact that Christ dealt with these people, with these tax collectors, uh, we, we know two of the tax collectors. We know that Matthew the apostle was one. We know Zacchaeus was one. But the fact that he met with them, the fact that he ate meals with them, indicated a weakness in his ability to really be a leader. Okay, there's a character weakness there, or he wouldn't have dealt with these people. He certainly wouldn't have gone into their homes for meals. And so they challenge him on this point. The people that are mentioned also include Christ's enemies, those who didn't like him. It appears that they didn't like him because they were jealous because he had a great following and he had, even though they were want to admit it, 
the ability to do miracles, which they did not have. And one of these groups, a religious sect of the day, was called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are almost always in opposition to Christ. Pharisees were, the word itself means separatist. Uh, they, they thought themselves better than everybody else. They followed the details of the law. They went so far as if they had an herb garden, they would pick out 10% of the new leaves and pluck them away so that they could donate them to the temple. Uh, I'm not real crazy about picking 10% of the peppermint or whatever else we grow, but they did. They went that far. Uh, in doing this. They believed in angels, they believed in the afterlife, and they would believe they were superior to any other people on the face of the earth. They thought that they were the only ones who were doing God's will. Christ often challenged them, not on the fact that they tried to obey the details of the law, but the fact they overlooked the greater points of the law of love and of caring and of tenderness. So they were at odds with Christ almost all the time. The other group that's mentioned as being with the Pharisees are the scribes. And the scribes were those who transcribed, who wrote out the books of the Old Testament and sold them, made them available for other people uh, through that. They were considered, at least by themselves, to be the experts on the law. When you read about lawyers in most instances in the New Testament, you're talking about the scribes. Not that they were advocates, <coughs> but rather that they were supposed to know the law because they wrote it out. Mr. Gutenberg has, was not around to perfect his printing press. If you don't remember your history, Mr. Gutenberg is given credit with making a printing press. Well, they didn't have printing presses. So all of the text, all of the books had to be written in hand, and that's what these individuals did. So what about our story here? We know that Christ has been accused by the priests, by the Pharisees, by the scribes of being somehow immoral because he is with immoral people. And so he, again, teaches by parable. And the parable is quite simple. There's an individual a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And that was, he was probably pretty well off. A hundred sheep was probably a, a pretty good amount to have at that day and time. And he lost one. And he's going looking for it. And that's basically the story. Now, sheep are unique animals. And I've never raised sheep, and I hope I never have to. Uh, if I have to raise sheep, we're all in a bunch of trouble because I'm not very good at that. Uh, but sheep are kind of unique animals that you can't drive sheep like you can drive cattle or horses. You have to lead sheep. And so they're not the brightest of animals in the world. They tend to wander away and you have to go find them. And that's what has happened here. The shepherds were unique individuals. And they were given the care of the sheep. Sometimes they cared for sheep that they owned, like is apparently the case here. Other times they cared for uh, <coughs> uh, sheep of others. And each shepherd knew his own flock uh, on site. Uh, and they were uh, very responsive to him. We, we know some famous shepherds. Who's the first one? Anybody remember? First shepherd. We studied about him not too long ago. Cain. Cain was a shepherd. And we know that Moses was a shepherd. I'm sorry. My wife shaking her head. Abel. I'm sorry. I got the wrong guy there. I know. One brother is less like another. No. Abel was the first shepherd. And then we have Moses, who was a shepherd for some 40 years. Uh, and then we have, of course, David. And David's. Uh, one of the most beautiful psalms, probably the best known part of the Bible is the 23rd Psalm, where David tells what a shepherd is and what he has to do. But the way that, that it normally functioned was the shepherds would come in the morning 
and they would collect their sheep. There would be a, a large number of sheep from other people, uh, and they would come and collect their sheep, and their sheep would know the shepherd's voice, and then he would lead them up into the mountains. You can't leave sheep in one area for very long. They'll destroy all the grass if you do. So you got to move them. And so this shepherd would take the sheep up into the mountain. They would find a place that had good water. Uh, they would find a place that had decent pasture, and they'd feed. <coughs> and while they were up there, I'm told that each sheep would come to the shepherd while the shepherd was resting. And the shepherd would spend a little bit of time with each one of his sheep uh, and getting to know them and so that they would feel protected. Well, in this instance, in the instance of this particular one, one of the sheep wanders off. And so when the shepherd gets him down and they're counted, either into a corral or into a big open place that's protected by all of the shepherds, uh, he's missing one. Uh, and he has to go after him. And, and that's the story here that we're faced with. Why did Christ tell this story? The Pharisees had complained. They whined. If you'll note there, they, they don't even bother to say Christ's name. They say this man and derogation of him. And they say, you're eating with all these sinners. And he tells this parable. And obviously the point of the parable is, if you're sinless, he didn't agree that they were, but if you are, I am come to find those who are not sinless, those who are in need of having their sins removed. That's my job. That's why I'm here. And just as this shepherd goes out and finds a lost sheep, I am seeking the lost sheep. And if you don't comprehend that, then you're not what you claim to be. You are not God's people if you don't understand the need for love, the need for redemption, and the need for tenderness. And that's what he provides. And that's why he tells this story. How can, <clears throat> excuse me, your speaker this morning is a little gimpy, I'm sorry. How can we apply this story to us? I fear sometimes that intellectually we understand the story, that there's an obligation to seek those who are lost. I fear that practically we, we don't do that. We don't go out and seek them. The hills around Palestine, there's a rocky mountains that run through the center of it, are very steep and they're very dangerous. And this shepherd goes out seeking one. From a practical standpoint, that's not necessarily the wise thing to do. Okay? He's got 99% of his animals. That's a large percentage. I generally take that percentage if those were the odds, 99 to 1. But he goes, he risks his life to find his sheep. I think we have an obligation to go beyond our comfort zone to bring in the lost sheep. That's not easy to do. That's pretty difficult to do, but that's our obligation. That's what we have that's going on here. We don't have the right to sit back and congratulate ourselves on how good we are. I'm not saying that we're bad. But our obligation is to go out and to bring in those who maybe don't have some of the blessings that we have. Some of us were, as the quotation goes, or the saying goes, born in the church. I was. As far back as I could remember, my grandparents attended church. My father and mother attended church. They brought me to church, like it or not. 
I was here from the time I was about this big uh, until now, when I'm substantially larger, unfortunately. But other people, some people don't have that advantage. But God is as willing to save them as he is to save us. That's what Christ teaches in this parable. God's salvation is available for all who will avail themselves of it. And we need to provide the way. That way is provided, as the text says, in earthen vessels. And we're that. That's us. You and me and everybody else. So that is what he teaches here. That is our obligation. If we fail in that obligation, I, I think we, we fail tremendously. We have to provide that for those. If you have not availed yourself of Christ's salvation, you have an opportunity to do that this morning. We have a baptistry. We have clothing. Uh, more, more than willing to provide that service for you if that's what you want. If you've done that, but you've somehow slipped back, we can assist you in making that correction as well. If we can assist you in any way, the good book allows. We'd ask you to come. All together we stand and sing our song. Ron. Jesus the loving shepherd calls me now to come into the fold of safety where there is rest and room. Come in the spring of man Come in the morn of youth, into the fold of safety, enter the way of truth. Lovingly, tenderly calling his name, wanderer, wanderer, come unto me, patiently waiting, the standing I say, Jesus, my shepherd, Jesus, the loving shepherd, gave his dear life for thee. Tenderly now he's calling, wanderer, come to me. Hey, for without his danger, come Christ the shepherd blessed. Enter the fold of safety, enter the place. Of rest, lovingly, tenderly calling you, see, wanderer, wanderer, come unto me, patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus, my shepherd divine, lingering is a calling, wolves are a frog today. Seeking the sheep or straying, seeking the lambs to slay. Jesus, the loving shepherd, call us now to come. Enter the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Love.